An Introduction to Dialectics by Theodore Adorno. Lecture 8, June 19th, 1958. Ladies and gentlemen, in our last couple of sessions, and especially in the last one, I tried to show you why the dialectic is not simply concerned with specific differences. That is, with the specification of the individual object, which is indeed, in the final analysis, an unavoidable condition of any knowledge, to show you rather why the dialectic is preeminently concerned with contradiction. And in this connection, I also tried to unfold the principle of contradiction itself from within the heart of Hegelian philosophy. One could say that the recognition of difference represents a kind of utopia, or rather, not so much the recognition of difference as difference itself, that the heterogeneous may coexist with the heterogeneous without each destroying the other, that one heterogeneous thing may leave room for the other to unfold as well, and that we may also add the heterogeneous may love and be loved. This would be the very dream of a reconciled world. Likewise, it is the mark of a world wretchedly entangled in a context of guilt that whatever is in some sense unacceptably heterogeneous cannot be tolerated within this world. This intolerance of the heterogeneous is the ultimate mark of every totalitarian mentality, and here we may use the word totalitarian in a multiplicity of senses. And the dialectic is the negative expression of a certain condition, a thinking which answers to a reality where contradiction has taken the place of the happiness promised by difference. A thinking which strives from within itself, from within its own principle, to bring about its own demise. Now we could say there is an important conclusion which emerges from this, although it is one which has not always been accepted or, or rigorously drawn as such, either within Hegelian philosophy or within the materialist version of the dialectic. This is the conclusion that dialectical thought itself responds to a negative condition of the world, and, indeed, calls this negative condition by its proper name. I once expressed this idea straightforwardly by claiming that the dialectic is essentially and necessarily critical, although it becomes false the instant that it sets itself up as a kind of positive philosophy, or so-called worldview, and claims to constitute an immediate appearance of truth itself. Where Hegel is concerned, these issues are extraordinarily complex. For you may well object here that the Hegelian philosophy as a whole ultimately presumes to present nothing short of the absolute idea or the absolute identity, and to that extent surely incurs the verdict which I have just suggested with regard to every positive interpretation of the dialectic as such. Nonetheless, I should like to believe that the power which effectively animates the Hegelian philosophy is actually very much the power of negation, namely a critical power at work in every specific moment, and that in contrast to this, the well-known affirmative moment of Hegel, which insinuates that in the totality, subject and object are ultimately the same, essentially exhibits significantly less power and force than the negative moment we have insisted upon. In response to the question, why the dialectic is concerned with contradiction, Rather than simply with difference, I basically claimed that this is precisely how thought is capable of acknowledging its moment of, of non-identity, of acknowledging what is not the same as thought, without thereby abandoning itself to arbitrariness of what merely is. Precisely how thought simultaneously retains the power to construe this dimension of the non-identical, to think that which for its own part is not actually the same as thought. What is usually described as logic is indeed nothing other than the doctrine of absolute identity and the heart of logic. The heart of all logical rules is the idea that the signs or concepts introduced in the domain of logic are maintained precisely as identical with themselves. Logic is thus nothing but the fully explicated theory of the rules, which arise from absolute identity exactly as this is preserved in logic at the expense of any content whatsoever, a content which, as Hegel has taught us, is always not simply included within these forms, but also comes into 
a certain opposition to them precisely because the content is not itself a form. One could thus almost construe the identity principle of logic entirely in these terms, and it is thoroughly to be expected, therefore, that the fundamental taboo erected by the discipline of logic is the principle of contradiction, namely the command, and it is a command rather than just a proposition, that of two mutually contradictory propositions, only one can be true, and that the laws of thought are violated, wherever that is not the case. One might say that the priority of contradiction, which prevails in the dialectic, is actually nothing but an attempt to break the primacy of logic, understood as the realm of pure non-contradiction. To point out, that is, that the world is not simply mere thought, is not the mere operation of logical thinking as the world is presented to us in accordance with logical rules. In other words, the world is itself a contradictory rather than a logical world. The dialectic is a critique of the apparent logical character of the world, of its immediate identity with our conceptual conceptuality. And that is precisely why it makes the principle of contradiction itself, which is repudiated by logic, for reasons which I have tried to clarify for you in our last few sessions, into its very medium or organon. But this means not only that the world is not simply exhausted in our concepts, but also at the same time that our concepts are not exhausted in that which merely is. In other words, the origin of the dialectic, which I initially developed for you from the side of thought, a form of the subject, can just as well be unfolded from the side of the objective as well, as Hegel has, always, has also shown in considerable detail. If you would like me to convey to you in simple terms the experience which inspired dialectical thought itself, and which persists as a basic stratum, as it were, beneath the level of the logical and speculative moments we have just been discussing, then I would describe the, this experience simply as a recognition of the contradictory or antagonistic character of reality itself. In other words, it is that experience of deremption that effectively lay at the heart of the Romantic Age, the period to which Hegel also belongs. And the specific character of Hegel's response to this lies in the way that he did not attempt, within the context of this deremption, to assume the limited and one-sided standpoint of the individual subject, simply thrown back upon itself and its own resources, but also in the way that he resisted the tendency, unlike the cultural classicism classism or classicism of the time to smooth over this contradictory character of reality or to resolve the situation as the later Goethe did by entering into some kind of understanding with this deremption. Rather, he took the bull by the horns in this regard, which is to say simply put that he pursued the thought that the reconciliation of a deremted world could not arise through any resolution somehow located over and above the objectively self-contradictory character of this world, but only in and through this self-contradictory self character itself. And the idea that this development, this driving force, and ultimately also that which strives for reconciliation, is something itself harbored within the, the deremption, the negative, the suffering of the world, this idea is equally as an experience of reality, a sustaining element of the Hegelian dialectic. Just as, in turn, those things which we have been discussing, the idea that no concept is identical with its object, also sustain and motivate the dialectic from the side of mere thought itself. And what is so impressive about Hegelian philosophy, we might say, is essentially bound up with the way in which those two roots of dialectical thought, on the one hand, the logical speculative dimension, on the other, the dimension of experience, which I have expounded with reference to the concept of deremption or alienation, are effectively brought together so that their inner unity is ultimately revealed within the dialectic. If you now take what I have said about the rigorous necessity of construing the totality by reference to contradiction and apply it to this dimension of experience, you will uncover a speculative proposition which certainly cannot be found in this form in Hegel himself although it may well preserve the truth of this philosophy more aptly than any other particular proposition could do. I am talking about the proposition that the world, and by world here, I mean the one 
which the process of experience in Hegel is substantially concerned with, namely the social and cultural or mediated world, is indeed an internally contradictory world, but is also a system. Thus, the highly distinctive character of Hegelian philosophy and the dialectic in general lies in the way it undertakes to construe a certain impressive unity while seeking this very unity in the moment of dichotomy, that is, in the moment of contradiction. And this highly distinctive character, this most paradoxical moment, is itself equally discovered in that experience from which Hegelian philosophy arises, in that experience of reality which is contained in the logical and speculative issues which we have been discussing in our last few sessions. We can also formulate it in this way. The world is construed as a unity, produced as a socialized totality, which is internally unified down to its ultimate particular features, through the very principle by which it is also divided. And it is precisely here that the materialist version of the dialectic is extraordinarily close to the idealist version, insofar as the former attempted to grasp and develop that unified but internally contradictory principle in objective terms, precisely as the principle of exchange, which indeed harbors both the antagonistic and the internally unified character of a world governed by the process of exchange. But I would like to come back to the well-known and popular objection of the dialectic, which accuses it of being an intellectual straitjacket, a deductive system which attempts to derive reality from purely conceptual considerations from everything that I have already said. You may now be able to appreciate and think through this complex of issues rather more clearly than was possible for you before. For this claim regarding the deductive or systematic character of the dialectic is both justified and unjustified, just as we, we can indeed say that the world in which we live is a system, that it is thus internally unified but also that it is profoundly dissonant and profoundly contradictory in itself. Indeed, from the perspective which I have suggested to you today, we can describe the dialectic as an attempt not merely to develop the logic of thought in its relation to objectivity, but also at the same time to develop the logic of objectivity itself. And indeed, as a logic which is not merely foisted on objectivity from the side of the subject, but as one that belongs to the matter itself. In this regard, of course, it is true that Hegel appeals to an idealist conceptual framework insofar as, for him, in the last analysis, everything may be regarded as the product of subjectivity. In this sense, Hegel thoroughly absorbed the most radical idealistic side of Fichte, and we would certainly be trivializing Hegel if we simply tried to eliminate this subjectivistic, subjectivistic aspect of Fichte from his thought. And once the whole of reality has been grasped, by Hegel in this sense as something generated by the subject, it is, naturally, it is naturally possible for him to try and abstract at, as it were, from the arbitrary influence of a limited and merely individual subjective consciousness. And since the subject is now recognized as the ultimate essence of objectivity itself, it is likewise possible to look for unity in the object itself, rather than grasping this unity simply as something which is constituted only through subjective conceptual operations. But all that is relatively easy to understand, and I do not particularly wish to insist upon this point here. But let me remind you once again that the Hegelian philosophy is also indeed a philosophy of experience, that it therefore emphatically acknowledges Fichte's famous claim that philosophy must be the union of the a priori and the a posteriori, and not merely a doctrine of the of the a priori aspects of experience, as it showed itself to be in Kant. In Fichte himself, this basically remained an, an ambitious program, and in his thought, he will look in vain for such a thorough treatment of experience. But in Hegel, the concept of experience is tremendously substantial in character, and it also expressly occurs in the original title of his first and most striking major work, The Phenomenology of Spirit. And if you look at Hegel's phenomenology, you will find that the concept of experience appears here in a most emphatic way, namely as the way that consciousness in examining itself also comes to experience itself as a kind of object, as the way that in the ongoing process of this experience, 
in the ongoing experience of our own life, for example, both the object that is observed and the subject that observes undergo, undergo change and modification in turn. If you take this idea of experience as seriously as I believe it needs to be taken in Hegel, and now that we have recognized the seriousness of the speculative moment in Hegel without incurring the sort of misunderstanding we find in Hartman, then perhaps we might say that the doctrine of the objective character of reality as a system, albeit at the same time a discordant system, is also in Hegel the fruit of such an experience. In other words, this doctrine springs just as much from an insight into reality as it did from the self-reflection of the concept in Hegel. And I believe that we can now actually see that Hegel was the first to realize something that we may perhaps also express quite independently of the specific idealist implications of his philosophical system. And since I wish to provide you with a concept of dialectic, which is also a rigorous conception of dialectic, albeit one which cannot be fully captured within the context of idealist theses, which have become so problematic for us. I believe that further considerations on this very point may not be wholly inappropriate here. For I think that the experience with which Hegel is concerned here, to formulate this more precisely than I have until now, is the experience that the order of the world, which we generally regard as the mere product of our concepts, as imposed by a subjective but coherent contribution of our own upon a more or less chaotic sensuous manifold, in the Kantian sense, that this conceptual order is already harbored in the matter itself. Now you might reply that this is itself surely the most extreme form of idealism, a, subject, a subjective idealism which essentially contains the whole of reality, where reality is the product of the subject. So it is no wonder if in turn it finds nothing in the object, but what it has already placed in the object through the a priori features which provide the transcendental conditions of knowledge. But that is not at all what I have in mind here, and it is very important, if you are to understand the specific character of the dialectic, that you grasp the difference which I am particularly interested in at this point. For what we are concerned with here are the conceptual elements involved in the, con in the constitution of reality, and which belongs to a quite different level, to a quite different dimension, than the conceptual elements of the scientific order that we confer upon things. What we are basically talking about here, and this is a moment which is also involved in the materialist dialectic, even though remarkably enough, it has never really been theoretically reflected upon as such, is the way there is actually already something conceptual in the fundamental dynamic of our existence. In the fundamental social dynamic of our existence, something which you might say has much less to do with knowledge than with the course of social processes themselves. I would like to leap ahead somewhat here and actually interpret the moment of internally antagonistic unity with which Hegel is also concerned precisely in terms of the moment of exchange, which has been identified by the materialist dialectic as the relevant principle. For it is clear that this principle of exchange, which largely determines objective social processes and far from being some special contribution on the part of the subject, actually lies in the matter itself, already harbors a conceptual aspect insofar as I can exchange something only where, and only to the degree that, I ignore the specific features of the objects to be exchanged, and refer them to an abstract and common form, the form of equivalence as it had, has been called, by means of which they become in a certain sense commensurable with one another. Thus, the principle which governs at least the life of bourgeois society as a whole, the society with which Hegelian philosophy is indeed ultimately and substantively concerned, is objectively defined in itself by this conceptual aspect. For this abstractness in the relations between human beings, which ignores both the contribution and the needs of human beings in relation to the goods they produce, and which now retains nothing but the common form that subsumes these goods, that renders them commensurable and exchangeable in the first place, is precisely that character of abstract time, which, since Kant, has also been profoundly grasped as the ultimate source of the so-called logical or metaphysical problem, problems of constitution. You will see at once that this objective conceptual moment in the matter itself, which is vividly exemplified in the phenomenon of exchange, that this conceptual labor of the human species, as we may describe it, 
is something entirely different from that understanding of the conceptual, which prevails in the contemporary conception of the logic of science, and also in the Kantian philosophy, where the conceptual is actually nothing but an ordering principle that we confer upon things. And I believe that the decisive experience of Hegel is precisely the insight that the world, which we, ne which we know is not, as the idealist philosophy would have us believe, something chaotic, which we ourselves first endow with some kind of form, and that the conceptual forms in turn, namely as a sediment of the history of mankind, are already contained in the reality we are attempting to know. But this presupposes that we grasp reality, as this is understood by philosophy, as something that is itself essentially marked or determined by human beings. It is determined not in the sense of the object of knowledge as abstractly and purely scientifically con constituted by the transcendental subject, but rather in the practical sense that the world philosophy undertakes to know is a world essentially mediated through human labor. The concept of spontaneity, of the generation of the original unity of apperception, which plays a central role in all idealist philosophy after the critique of pure reason, and Hegel already assumes the form that the world itself, the world in which human beings live, is actually a world of labor, and that this moment of labor cannot be ignored, so that there is actually no nature which fails to bear, even if it be merely negatively, the trace of human labor. And if you now ask for an interpretation of the Hegelian concept of, of mediation in terms of experience, a concept that I would certainly like to talk to you about today, we could say that what Hegel means by mediation, what he means by the claim that there is nothing under the heavens which is not mediated, already signifies in Hegel that there is actually nothing human which is not determinately marked by the moment of human labor. If you consider this thought concerning the objective determinancy of reality, which cannot be deemed a subjective contribution that might, be, might in turn be ignored, and pursue it a little more closely, you can also readily connect it with the charge that has so often been raised against Hegel in a superficial manner, namely that of fabricating a fundamentally constricting d deductive system. I believe it is not the task of the philosopher in expounding a philosophy which seems deserving of the name to proceed apologetically in this regard, to say, for example, well, the dialectic is not nearly as bad as the malicious critics of dialectic like to claim, for it is for it is also leaves room for that it does leave room in this regard. Oh, sorry. For it also leaves room for the whole range of experience, and God knows that knows what. Now I believe that it does leave room in this regard, and I have tried to show as much to the degree that was possible here. But I also believe that we must be extraordinarily careful not to make everything innocuous or, as Hegel puts it, not to leave out the dialectical salt. And I would far rather confess that dialectical philosophy, in both of its versions, actually does have something essential to do with the coercive character of a, dedu of a deductive system. Yet I would qualify this by insisting that dialectical philosophy does not simply do violence to a reality that is ever so green, ever so living, ever so immediate and spontaneous in itself. On the contrary, dialectical philosophy is the means of expressing, in concepts, in the medium of the concept, the coercive and restrictive character which reality itself possesses. We could really say of the dialectic that it outdoes the rogue here. In other words, the coercive, const coercive construction which dialectical philosophy seems to expect from us is actually none other than the objective compulsion which a fatefully interlinked world exercises upon us. And in this regard, we can now properly understand the wretchedness of that complaint about the straitjacket of concepts. Once it, is, once it is revealed as nothing but the cry, stop thief. Thus the dialectic is reproached for revealing the compulsive character of the world while the compulsive character itself is thereby ideologically protected. The irrationalism which opposes Hegel then turns into apologetics, whereas the denunciation of this compulsive character, even under the compulsion of conceptual construction, grants justice for what might be otherwise, for what is not already subjected to such compulsion, 
for difference and place a system alone. You could also express this by saying that without this compulsive character, there would be nothing beyond mere facticity. Without theory, and the dialectic in this comprehensive sense is the very paradigm of what we may call theory as such, there would be no genuine knowledge, but merely observations of data. And if we stayed put with these observations, we would not only fail to advance towards truth, but we would thereby already speak with untruth, would think with untruth, precisely because those observations which act or present themselves as if they were a matter of mere immediacy, as if they were simply there, are all already mediated. That is to say, they also bear the social totality within themselves, and this is something that can only be revealed through the process of dialectical construction, i.e. through theory itself. Thus, the systematic character of the dialectic would be precisely that of the system which constitutes reality, namely the, dyna the dynamic of the system which in a sense develops as a kind of fatality, a system whose fatal character every individual can realize and exhibit at every moment in each particular case. In this regard, dialectical philosophy is infinitely more realistic, is infinitely less guilty of spinning out some merely conceptual web than those much more innocuous theories which proceed as if the world did not in itself possess a specific character, and thereby precisely overlook what is decisive here, namely the compulsion which the world itself exercises upon us. In the light of these motifs, as I have just described, or yeah, and developed them, you can readily understand how a theory which originally appeared so conservative, as if it wished to defend the world as a system, could also, in exhibiting that system at the same time in its negative character, become a starting point for the revolutionary conception of socialism, which then directly referred back to it. Indeed, you can see precisely how these two moments interact with one another, and it would be a very interesting task to pursue how much, in their polemical extremes, in their specific repudiation of certain perspectives, such as a mediocre, overly harmonizing conception of individualism, the two versions of dialectic, the Hegelian and the Marxist, both actually concur with one another. This is a task which has still to be undertaken, although it is imperative for the self-understanding of dialectical theory that this should be done properly. I think I have now shown you the sense in which the systematic character of the dialectic must be understood as a critical concept. For while the moment of unity that is singled out by this system, and which leaves nothing outside it, certainly represents the moment of compulsion to which living human beings are subjected, and from which they must strive to liberate themselves, this same moment of unity, as a dynamic and internally self-unfolding one, also has the potential to drive towards its own demise. Something like this was once formulated by Hegel himself, who perceived these things with a tremendous clarity and sobriety when he argued in several famous passages in the philosophy of right that civil society, through its very own principle, necessarily created more poverty, even as it created more wealth. And perhaps I might also add here that the celebrated role which Hegel apolo apologetically ascribed to the state finds its origin here origin right here. For with a kind of desperate leap out of the dialectic, as we might say, Hegel introduced the state as a sort of umpire, which is meant to bring some order to what would otherwise fall apart through the growth of internal oppositions in accordance um, with the very dialectic he has identified. But even here, as I say this, even as I claim heretically that Hegel has offered a kind of arbitrary or coercive construction here in order to preserve the positive character of his system. I should also add that even this passage, which looks at first sight like a sacrificio del intelletto, and one, and one which indeed has always particularly irritated even medio mediocre and intellectually feeble critics, nonetheless betrays the most profound insight. For bourgeois or civil society, insofar as it tries to maintain itself as such under its own conditions, is ultimately driven in the final phase of its development to generate organizational forms of a statist or authoritarian kind, forms which no longer trust to the imminent play of economic forces, but now attempt to stem this dynamic in a course of fashion and return society to the stage of simple self-reproduction. Self
One could therefore say, if we wish to express this in a very sober way, that Hegel's doctrine of the state and his conception of the fulfillment of absolute spirit in the state would be completely true if only it were presented to us specifically as a negative theory. That is, if it effectively attempted to show that civil society at its end, in order to preserve itself as such, necessarily reveals a tendency towards fascism and the totalitarian state, and that a civil society which remained faithful to its own system ad infinitum cannot actually be envisaged. But the momentous conclusion which is implicit in Hegel's philosophy of the state has, for essentially apologetic reasons, never really been drawn in any quarter. That is all for now regarding the justification of the dialectic as a deductive structure which captures something to which our life is indeed subjected. But then again, the dialectic is not simply a seamless or immediately deductive structure. It does not operate in terms of pure identity, and it does not try to derive everything seamlessly from a single principle or proposition. And precisely because it does not proceed in this way, the central function of contradiction in the dialectic is understood from the perspective of the matter itself. In other words, in unfolding the matter in question as one that is internally contradictory, it also unfolds it as something that is deremptive, as something that is not identical with itself. Um, and in this, and in this sense, it is specifically a critical theory. Thus, the dialectic also implies that the true philosophical concept must involve both the deductive element and the element of experience. I would like to conclude by pointing out that the concept of experience, like all concepts in Hegel, is not to be understood in a primitive or immediate fashion. When I speak of experience here, you should not think of it in terms of a narrowly defined sensuous experience, as this is presented in the so-called empiricist philosophers. For when Hegel speaks of experience, he means something like the experience of consciousness, namely the way in which human beings who are aware of their thought aware of the continuity of their life as a whole and of reality, also experience this reality as a whole and attempt to realize what Hegel described in his Propedeutic as freedom with regard to the object. That is to say, we may realize the sovereign freedom, which refrains from violently imposing aspects of our own upon this reality, which opens itself up to this reality, which traces and responds to the object as it were. This kind of responsiveness of productive passivity or spontaneous receptivity is really what the concept of experience, and in particular the concept of the experience of consciousness, means in Hegel as a specific attitude of thought. But what falls within this experience is social reality as an undiminished whole, and the one who undergoes this experience is the whole human being with every attendant faculty and capacity, and not merely a transcendental subject or indeed merely an experimental subject that simply registers sensuous data or particular particularities of some kind or other, just as the concept of spirit in Hegel always involves the concept of experience. So in turn, the concept of experience in Hegel acquires meaning only when you grasp it essentially and precisely as what may perhaps simply, as what we may perhaps simply call spiritual experience.